Good morning, everyone. It is February 3rd. This is a joint meeting with, Ho with House Health Care and Senate Health and Welfare. And Representative Lippert and I will be um, guiding the testimony this morning. Um, but let me just say that this is an opportunity for us to look at um, extending or not some of the flexibilities and deadlines that we had put in place during the pandemic in our bills. Uh, I think it was, it was it Act 40 and Act, Act 40 and Act um, 91 and Act 91, thank you. And 140, 140, right. And then a little bit of 159. I was looking for the other number. Thanks, Bill. So we'll, so as we're going through the testimony, we have a pretty heavy morning of testimony until 930. It would be great if you, um, if you have a question of clarification to ask that question, but let's try to hold any discussion and dialogue until we're back in with our own committees or maybe if we have time at the end. Bill, are your thoughts on that as well? Well, uh, thank Representative you. Representative Leppert, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, so we in the House Healthcare Committee have been taking uh, actually considerable testimony on the audio only uh, issue uh, that we received a uh, report from. And I think many of the, many of the witnesses today are, uh, were part of crafting recommendations of, not, not a completely consensus recommendation, but they're a different recommendation. And I'm wondering, so Senator Lyons, I'm wondering, uh, so there's really, it seems to me there's two broad categories of uh, question for us to look at in terms of extending deadlines. There's the COVID emergency legislation that we all crafted and worked on and updated, many of which, uh, many of which have a March 31st deadline at this point, March 31st, 2021. And we recognize, of course, that there's something that if we do nothing, uh, we will lose the opportunity to continue the flexibility that we created in the COVID emergency. Uh, so there's those. And then there's the audio only portion, which I think has a number of number of related issues. And so um, I just want to distinguish the two because our committee is taking a great deal of testimony on the audio only piece. And I wondered if we could, if it, if it might be helpful to uh, when we ask witnesses to comment, to focus uh, initially on the um, uh, extension of deadlines generally. Good. This is a very good suggestion, and, and thank you for that. Um, our and, committee. And, and, and if ahead. I may, just just and, excuse sure. me. If I may, and I know that you have had uh, uh, some language crafted, but one of the questions as well is, if those deadlines are extended, which I think many of us believe they should be. But should they be extended beyond what point? Uh, should it be, what, what, what's the marker for the extension? Is it a state emergency of declaration? Should they be extended three months? Should they be extended six months? Uh, and I think if we could come to closure on that, that would be very helpful because I think, we, I think that's something we probably ask, could we ask, ask the witnesses to focus on. Good, thank you for that. Um, our, our committee did has taken testimony on some draft legislation, which is posted on our webpage. And um, Nellie, if it, if it, uh, it should be up for today, so I'm hoping it's there. And uh, you're welcome. I sent it to Representative Lippert. It really is uh, an enumeration of the flexibilities that we had in place and extension of deadlines. The draft legislation includes a three month extension for the most part. So the, so the question about is it three months or six months or what is the time frame? You know, it, it, it will have to listen to the folks who are testifying and get their uh, input on this. I think that will be very helpful. Um, and then as, as Representative Lippert said, our committee uh, has taken less testimony on the audio only. And I think given the work that the House has done on this, it's going to be, um, it's going to be a House uh, proposal that, that we look at initially. So uh, we'll work, we'll continue to work together, right? You know, whether, yeah. whether, whatever goes from, uh, from Senate to House and back is, uh, we'll, at least we'll try to gain some 
consensus as we're yeah. uh, working along. Right. And the other, the other last thing I, uh, uh, last thing I want to say is that uh, we also will be looking at um, one or two, uh, a couple of provisions. I'm not sure how many that deal more with uh, human services side of things, and so we may have some of those in the bill as well. And I have communicated with the chair of uh, House Human Services about that, and we'll make sure that that's all coordinated as well. So we'll try to get it all together in one bill so we don't have a lot of little things going back and forth. And, and perhaps just to say procedurally, I think our goal, uh, unspoken perhaps, but our goal is to move this because the March 31st deadlines are in statute to move a bill through the Senate, through the House, uh, or the reverse, well, however we choose to do it, but to move it through both bodies uh, probably prior to crossover even, or if not very soon after crossover. And I've had that conversation with the Speaker of the House who understands and fully supports, understands that this is a, this is a COVID emergency piece of legislation that needs to move as a priority and not be encumbered or have, any, have the crossover be any impediment. So that's part of why Senator Lyons and I are doing this joint testimony today to try to expedite uh, um, both our committees in working to move this forward. Okay, good. So terrific, and thank you all for being here. Why don't we uh, get started with our testimony? Um, uh, with Jen Carby is first, but Jen, I'm I I think unless you have something uh, to help us as we're looking at the information, we'll move on to testimony. Did you want to say anything first? Um, thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, Jennifer Carvey, Legislative Council. I think um, just to sort of frame again your discussion for today, the provisions of Acts 91 and 140 um, have, have uh, administrative and regulatory flexibility that they've provided during the COVID-19 time period. Some of the provisions expire March 31st. Some of them expire June 30th. Um, a few are already tied to some period of time after the end of the state of emergency. Um, and so the question for you is whether you want to extend any of the provisions that are otherwise going to end on their own, and if so, for how long? Okay, thank you. That's great. In a nutshell. All right, so let's um, let's begin with uh, Lauren Hibbert, uh, Office of Professional Regulation. And as I we we each each committee has the table that Jen put together on the uh, timelines, deadlines, flexibilities, and now we should each have a copy of the draft legislation. Um, I'm thinking that looking at the table might be the most expeditious or the simplest thing to do today. So if, if you have that in, on your iPads or in front of you, that would be helpful. Lauren, welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much, Senator Lyons. Uh, for the record, my name is Lauren Hibbert. I am the director of the Office of Professional Regulation. And there's some new faces here, um, people that I haven't spoken to directly before. So I'll just say a very thumbnail of what OPR is. Uh, we are the regulatory oversight umbrella for, we're now at 50 professions. Um, importantly for this conversation, we oversee um, healthcare professionals, everyone except for the people who are regulated under the medical practice board, which are um, allopathic physicians, podiatrists, a few other folks, but um, the majority of the healthcare professionals in Vermont are regulated by OPR. Um, I want to say thank you very much for this bill um, in its entirety. It's helped us through um, an incredibly stressful time. Um, OPR has been um, triaging, trying to help wherever we can during COVID, um, and the provisions of Act 140 have helped us tremendously. Um, on the deadline extension, um, I appreciate the state of emergency plus three months but I do have a preference to have it set out to a set date. And the set date that I think makes sense is a year from the March date. And the reason is I understand that may seem like a long time, 
Um, but in terms of communicating these emergency provisions and start in terms of setting up the operations to house these emergency provisions, it took considerable time and effort um, and messaging and a firm date would be helpful in terms of talking to mental health providers, to people who are in facilities. I think it's important to remember, particularly for the OPR professions, that we have folks um, who are in big hospitals um, and in local practices, but we also have a lot of solo practitioners, a lot of mental health practitioners um, who are trying to navigate what is a very complicated thing um, providing healthcare during um, a state of emergency. So being able to communicate clearly to them that um, these provisions continue until this date um, and to have it be a date certain um, is helpful. Um, the way that the emergency orders have been coming and um, I would never wanna be in the place where I have to be the author of emergency orders. So I have a lot of deference to the process, um, but they come in, you know, they come and they're for two months or three months, and then we don't know when the, the next one is going to come. So there's not a lot of surety um, that of how long the state of emergency is going to be. And then I'm concerned that three months may not be enough time to communicate clearly to people and to get people appropriately licensed if they need a license here. And I'm happy to go. Um, section by section if the committee is interested in um, how we've used the sections um, of this bill or whether I still think they're necessary. I am prepared to do that if you're interested or I could prepare that in writing, Senator Lyons if, and um, Representative Lippert if you'd prefer. Um, I, you know, I think it would be helpful for us to hear two things, uh, a, a thumbnail of whether or not these extensions were helpful um, maybe a, a, a short comment about the helpfulness. And then secondly, um, just a comment about how many of these that you would might be recommending that do not go forward. And then I think in writing would be, um, would be a good way to go. I'm happy to provide it in writing as well. So um, very, um, Fortunately, the, the first two sections that we no longer need, um, if it's okay, I'll take your two questions in reverse order. Um, <laughs> the two sections that um, OPR does not see, to, see a continued need for are section 10, which begins on page seven of your draft legislation and section 11, which begins on page eight of your draft legislation. These are both pharmacy um, sections that are part of, um, we put them in, um, I'll never forget our time in the middle of March in uh, Representative Lippert's committee, you know, long days all together, but we put these two sections in, they were concepts at that point that were contained in the OPR bill. Um, section 10 is, um, it's short, it's basically um, being able to fulfill a prescription without an order if it's a standing prescription. Um, we don't need that anymore because the OPR bill did pass and that um, pharmacists now have authority to issue short-term extensions. These are five-day extensions with notification to a prescriber. And that a new authority is under um, 26 VSA um, section 2023B6A. Um, so section 10 is no longer needed. And similarly, section 11 which is therapeutic substitution is no longer needed because that authority is now in the law as well with the OPR bill, um, which was S220 um, effective um, October 1st. Um, so that section is 2023B4. So I do recommend striking those two sections. Um, and I understand that that's then gonna screw up all the section numbers. So I apologize oh, yeah, in okay. advance. <laughs> Um, we have used section 17 um, and 18 quite a bit. Section 17 is the deemed licensed if you're, um, and that means that you're qualified to practice in this state if you hold a valid license in another state. Um, if you're working in a Vermont facility, you must be registered. But I will say that the majority of the folks under this section have been doing telehealth. 
um, telehealth um, has been um, really widely used. We've, we have many guidance documents on our website about telehealth at this point and people call us. We still are receiving so many questions about telehealth, um, but it's obviously um, a very nece necessary thing right now. And section 18 is similar, that's for retired people. Um, if you're retired for under three years, then you can do telehealth unless you're working in a Vermont facility where you have to be registered. And if you're retired for more than three years, but under 10 years, then you can seek out um, a temporary license. And on numbers, these have been very well used. Um, we, my data is two days old, so we might have a couple more, but right now um, we have 536 emergency licenses and 2,441 people on the registry. Wow. And we know that there are more people that are um, providing telehealth but don't have to check in. And I guess for the folks who haven't heard me talk about professional regulation before, I just wanna reemphasize that OPR exists to protect the public. That is our first and primary function. Um, that's why we were created. I would not be recommending a year long extension if we had seen problems with these provisions. And I went through all of our complaint data since um, COVID um, began, and we have not seen any indication, any complaints of people using these emergency profession provisions in improper ways. Um, and so that's what is guiding me and feeling comfortable saying um, that I believe that an extension for a year out would work. Um, if the co committees are um, committed to the emergency order plus three months concept um, or the emergency order plus something, I would just ask the committee to explore, you know, emergency order plus six because it has been an, a large educational ramp. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize that a lot of our um, licensees do not work in big institutions. Many of them do, but um, I would say probably a third of them are in small practices or solo practices aren't part of the larger network. And that's where um, communication has fallen down, I would say. Um, then section 20 is the emergency authority to act. I would ask that this be continued. I will say um, this section was used um, quite a bit in the beginning of COVID. Um, this is where I as the director can stand in um, on behalf of a board if we have an inability to provide a quorum. Um, we have not, we've been able to provide a quorum since probably July, um, but I, this isn't, doesn't hurt anything and we don't necessarily know what's coming. Um, I used this authority um, between March and July as we were developing our emergency rules for remote hearings. Um, to sign decisions on summary dis, um, suspension orders of nurses diverting narcotics. Um, and I will say um, that was very helpful. Um, section 21, which begins on page 14 is emergency orders. I would ask that this be continued. Um, that section um, I used, I don't wanna say quite frequently, but I did use it um, with, and I haven't used it in the last three months, but um, we did have some practices that were um, dangerous to the health, self, safety, or welfare of the public. Um, some notable ones um, that did make the news, so maybe you've heard of it, was some MMA fighting um, with um, unlicensed people holding MMA fights um, and having children wrestling. So um, that was very alarming, and we were able to stop that activity um, thanks to this provision. Again, very forward thinking that one, I it was two or three days in March, very forward thinking um, and deeply appreciated. And then section 14, which um, I forget which page it's on, it's on the very bottom. Um, I've lost the page, I apologize. Jen, maybe you can, I'm what, sorry. What, what, what section is it, Lauren? It's section 14, it's at the very bottom of the draft bill. It's about um, the ability to um, issue emergency licenses to people who cannot take yeah. their exam. 
16, page 16. Yeah, page 16, yeah. So that section is not necessary because we did add that um, authority to the permanent um, statutes and that's now housed in 3 VSA section 129A 10A2. Um, and we have um, allowed people, particularly um, nursing um, students who were unable to take their exams due to COVID, um, practice while they're waiting for their exams. There was a period where all of the exams shut down. Um, now there are exams happening. The national exams are happening. Um, they're just, they're taking a lot longer. And, um, and uh, they, you know, people are waiting nine months for an exam, but they are taking them. And I will say that this provision is not specific to healthcare, which I do appreciate as well, because um, the pandemic, um, affected everybody. Um, and um, there were many people graduating from engineering programs, architect programs, you name it, um, accountancy programs who could not take the national exam and could not start working until that key was unlocked. So that was a very good um, policy and um, it's now in permanent law and we don't no longer need that section. So, so can okay. I just, can Go I just ahead. jump in here and say, so, so you had earlier said that we no longer needed section 10 and 11, but you're also including section 14 as no longer needed as well. Is that correct? That's correct. I apologize. I had forgotten about section 14. That's fine. I just want to make sure that we have, and our ledge council is following uh, that so we can revise any statutory proposal we put together. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, that was pretty clear and thank you uh, for that. The, the extension to a date certain, um, we'll, we'll have to ask others what their thoughts are, but certainly from your perspective is, is helpful to the folks who you um, regulate and are within your jurisdiction. And, and might I say that it's, it's actually on behalf of our committee and your, our, both our committees, it's helpful to know that there was, that there was really impact from uh, the work that we, like, as you acknowledge, we all did very uh, under enormous pressure, but with trying to be as thorough as possible, as forward looking as possible. And so hearing, hearing that it would, had an impact uh, is helpful to us in thinking about how we, uh, how we did our work and how we do things going forward. Yes, I'd, I'd just like to say, Representative Lippert, with true candor, I don't, there hasn't been anything that I think we missed. Um, I really, um, I'm really grateful for that time and for this work and it was, um, has proved to be um, very helpful. And I'll say that, um, you know, I speak with other sister uh, regulatory authorities like myself and um, many of them wish that they had legislation like we have um, at this point. And that became particularly painful when the legislatures um, were not functional because of COVID or um, had gone home, had done a special session, but didn't get some work done in other states. This has just been a very large pressure point. Um, and Vermont is seen um, as very forward thinking in how they've approached this. And I'm Speaking about that to NCSL on the middle of um, March, how Vermont handled this. So thank you. It was a team effort. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, thank you for that comment. Uh, Senator Hooker has her hand up, and um, we're I think questions of clarification. Um, so go ahead, Senator Hooker. Correct. Correct. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Lauren. This is really helpful. I do have a, a, just a curiosity about Section 18 and those people who are doing telehealth but don't have to register. Uh, and do you have ideas of you know how many people are doing that, and why why not you know keep a list or have them at least weigh in somehow? Well. I, I don't know how many, I don't think it's as many as um, people might assume um, based on call volume, because there are so many questions about um, telehealth. I would assume that we would hear more from out of state folks asking questions um, if there was a large, large group. Um, I will say most of our telehealth questions are coming from Vermont professionals who had to switch um, their delivery model. Um, 
why it's happening, um, a big driver was mental health. Um, honestly, um, we had a lot of college students come home in um, March and April who had been receiving mental health treatment in another um, state at their at their college, their institution, and all of those um, therapists wanted to continue counseling services for their students. So that has been the largest source of um, questions and answers that we've provided. Um, I do think that, you know, obviously we are a small state. We, we um, have many Vermont um, patients who um, receive care in New York and New Hampshire, um, some in Massachusetts, but more in New York and New Hampshire. Um, and that is was totally fine when the patient crossed the river in their car. But once that patient stopped crossing the river or the lake in their car, um, the regulatory rules prohibited that conduct. So um, I know that that has been um, a source of use of telehealth um, and flexibility. I hope that's responsive to your question. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact number. And in terms of, oh, I, I remembered a little piece, um, in terms of requiring them to register, um, I suppose we could. Um, I don't think the registry is a huge barrier. It's, it's the messaging at this point. I don't know who um, these folks are and they're looking at our website and I could put you know, some glaring things on our website um, to get registered. Um, but at this point, I just, I'm concerned about shifting our approach. From my perspective, the approach has worked very well. I don't think it, many of the items are not long-term solutions to healthcare in the state of Vermont, clearly, but some of them are. Um, and telehealth for out-of-state licensees um, doesn't make me comfortable in a long-term fashion forever, um, but I do feel comfortable right now um, based on the data that I'm seeing. Thank you. And, and given no complaints, it seems uh, things are working. Uh, yes. Representative Peterson has his hand up. Yes, thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, I wanted to get just clarification on Section 21 and what it gives you the authority to do. Uh, it, it sounds like, and I'll, I'll give you my take as, as in reading it, that you have the authority to stop a licensed entity from doing something that's unsafe. Is that, yes, is that, that fair to say? That is correct. Yes, I can issue an emergency order um, that acts um, sort of like a cease and desist order. Okay, but only for licensed uh, entities. That's right, only for licensed entities or a licensed activity. Okay. So um, you could be holding a license or you could be um, doing, engaging in a practice that would require a license. Okay, if I want to have a, a big uh, bonfire, invite all my neighbors over um, and no one has a mask on, you can't intervene in that. Not to say that I would, I'm just giving it, but just trying to understand where your authority is, that's all. I may have private internal thoughts, but I cannot act on behalf of the state. <laughs> okay, that, that's all I care about. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll get the bonfire going. I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> we'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> as long as we stay six feet apart. And masks. And masked, then I can do nothing and I would Prefer come. Preferably double masks. Okay, any other questions of clarification? Thank you, um, Lauren. It's Thank you very much. To see you again and have the hear the report, the update. I'm um, happy to come back anytime. Thank you. Terrific. And so next on the list is Jessa Barnard, um, representing the Vermont Medical Society. And I know, and we'll just keep going. Good morning. Thank you very much. Hopefully I'm up on your screen now. I'm Jessa Barnard with the Vermont Medical Society. Um, and I will say I am also, I have the, the pleasure and I'm very proud to be representing not just my own organization today, but to be speaking on behalf of a informal coalition of healthcare provider associations who have been meeting 
regularly during the pandemic. So again, just to introduce my organization for those who I haven't met yet, uh, the Medical Society represents physicians and physician assistants in all various specialties and locations around the state. Um, but more importantly, this, this coalition of healthcare provider associations, we don't have an official name. There were some, some uh, ideas about last session kind of in jest, um, but we've been working really closely together. I did submit a little outline of our comments and on the back of the second page, you'll see all the organizations that are part of this. It ranges from hospitals to long-term care, the FQHCs, uh, Vermont Care Partners, the Dental Society, the Naturopathic Physicians, Independent Physicians, the VNAs. So we really cover the healthcare spectrum. Um, during the height of the pandemic in the spring, we were talking three times a week. I think now we're meeting twice a week and coordinating on all sorts of efforts from, um, at this point, vaccine administration, but earlier on it was um, access to PPE and testing supplies or um, any number of questions and how our organizations can implement them. So some of our work is um, on the advocacy side, what do we need um, in a regulatory or advocacy environment to help us serve the patients of Vermont, but some of it's really the implementation, how can our organizations either work together or uh, learn from each other to, to help the patients of Vermont. So um, this testimony is on behalf of the coalition and you will see there is a long list of folks um, to testify today. I'm actually kind of coordinating that effort. So I have certain subject matter expertise, but I've asked some friends to be on here with me um, in case there are areas you have questions on some of the sections. I am not the expert, but I could tap those other people, but we are not all planning to testify. In fact, I'm the only one on your list, let's see if I have your, your list up here, um, at least on the, the provider side, um, who had prepared comments. So down through Devin Green, um, again, they're all on in case there are questions, but they're not you know, planning to, to speak or present unless we need them. Um, so thank you for giving us that flexibility and letting them be on Zoom with us um, if, if things come up that I can't address. Um, our basic goals as a coalition are, um, in terms of the deadlines, a consistency, clarity and some sort of off-ramp. Um, so we'd really prefer that any sections being extended are extended to the same point in time, just because it's been very um, challenging, I'm sure not only for the legislature, but for us and our members to, you know, every certain couple of months be back re revisiting this bill section by section and figuring out which we need or don't need. Um, so our ask would be that they're, they're all extended um, and extended to the same point in time, or at least all of the ones we agree need to be extended. Um, and then the point about the off-ramp, I think Lauren Hibbert brought this up um, in, a, in a nice way, is that we need for some of these, or really for most of them, some kind of transition period. We need to know, okay, if licensure is being reinstated for telehealth, for example, um, folks need time to go through the full licensure process and be aware of it and get licensed and, and that sort of thing. So with all that said, um, I want to um, thank very much the chair for putting in this draft. We uh, draft, um, what is it, draft request 21 0729. Um, and I think actually, the, you know, initially over the, in the past uh, month or two, when our organizations were talking about it, we supported this idea of the state of emergency plus three months. Um, but in talking to Lauren Hibbert and OPR and amongst our organizations, we actually re really strongly support Lauren and OPR's suggestion of. March 2022, um, that again gives us a clear date to have in mind. It gives us enough time, we think. And the other benefit is it's when the legislature is back in session. So in case the state of emergency ended in June, July, August, and there was a problem with transition from one of these sections, there'd be really no way to address that until you're back in January. Um, where March, like the, the, how we picked March this time around, it gives some time for you to come back into session to hear some testimony and take action if needed. Uh, so that did, uh, when Lauren suggested that, they made a, that made a lot of sense to us. And so we would um, support that. Um, I will say, you know, as a, as a coalition, we had not had a chance to talk about the, the pieces that Lauren mentioned around the cu couple pieces she did not think needed to be extended because they're in the OPR bill, but we really defer to her on those pieces. So I don't think we would have any concern with those sections. And again, in our testimony we submitted, it listed those sections for extension. Um, but if, if OPR thinks they have that in their underlying statute, then we're really comfortable with that. Um, other than those sections she mentioned, we do support extending all of the ones that are in the draft that um, we saw from Senate Health and Welfare yesterday. Um, 
I will, I will speak to a couple of them. Again, my expertise are more in the licensing areas and the telehealth areas. Um, but if you have questions about some of the other pieces, like for example, you know, provider tax or um, some of the inpatient pieces or long-term care pieces, we can call on others who are on the on on Zoom but off camera at the moment. Um, I just want to echo what Lauren said about sections 17 and 18 about out of state and retired healthcare professionals, you know, representing physicians and physician assistants. We do know these have both been used and very helpful. As Lauren said, we share a lot of patients with New Hampshire and Massachusetts and New York. And as, just as a reminder for those on the committee, because I'm not sure this has really explicitly come up yet, um, um, maybe Jen walked through this, but to offer telehealth, the current sort of state of the state in Every, almost every state of the country is you have to be licensed in the state the patient is located. So if Vermont changes this requirement, it's really for those out of state clinicians to be able to provide care into Vermont for Vermont clinicians. Vermont has also, Vermont clinicians have had to be aware of what has changed under the state of emergency in those states surrounding us if they want to follow their patients who say live in New Hampshire, but get their um, you know, traditionally have been seen in Vermont. I did submit one of the um, handouts I attached is a sort of a cheat sheet chart that VMS and the hospital association put together back in March, because um, it is complicated. It's kind of a matrix. Where are you located? What type of facility are you in? Um, and what has sort of what applies without the pandemic and with the pandemic in terms of licensure. But these have been very helpful. I think it goes a little bit to Senator Hooker's question about why not change to registering for telehealth. I think honestly, at this point, it's really a simplicity piece. We support what Lauren said about that. We're just, um, you know, we, we, it's already, there's the, the sands have been shifting, you know, daily, weekly, monthly in terms of the regulatory environment for COVID and all sorts of areas. And so this would be an area where we would just prefer the simplicity of continuing what's in place um, for now. Certainly, um, I actually, I noted um, Senator Hardy's question from yesterday, which I think was a really great one about which pieces do we wanna look at carrying forward more permanently or what have we learned from the, the state? And I think there's been a lot of questions, a lot of conversations, at least on the provider community side about licensure for telehealth long-term. And do we, is it still, um, is it still kind of the right policy decision that you have to have a full license in every state where you practice? You know, it's been an issue, you know, you have a patient on vacation for a week in South Carolina, that Vermont provider technically is not supposed to call in a prescription, um, talk to you on the phone and give you advice unless they are licensed in South Carolina. Um, and we know that already, we know that happens and none, I don't think any of us really like the solution of just kind of turning a blind eye to it. So, uh, you know, it may be an issue where some of us are, are back with your committees um, in the future to talk about, you know, what could something look like in the telehealth licensure world. But for now, we would support continuing the status quo for um, the next year. Um, let me just see, I think I noted some other, um, oh, on section 26 on telehealth, um, the HIPAA and consent waivers, I know Senator Lyons asked some questions about that yesterday. Uh, we do see many providers already switching to HIPAA compliant telehealth platforms. We have encouraged our members, I know other associations we work with like the hospital association and bi-state primary care have encouraged clinicians to be implementing consent. Um, so I think, again, it's one of these off-ramp or transition um, pieces. You know, telehealth went from very, very little use to explosion of use in March. And when we're now kind of getting to more of a um, status quo uh, place. And so just some more time to work on that transition. I know people have mentioned Zoom. Actually, Zoom has a HIPAA compliant platform. So if you're talking to your provider on Zoom, they may already be HIPAA compliant. Um, but the real... Um, the real reason that this happened, not only in Vermont, but actually at the federal level, they allowed um, non-HIPAA compliant platforms or things like FaceTime um, or something like that, where maybe there's a way to connect with a video, um, but, but the patient or provider hasn't yet had time to set up a platform. So I think we will see this changing over time, but again, that year time just gives a little bit of a, gives notice and, and opportunity for all of those clinicians to transfer over to, to being HIPAA compliant and making sure they have consent implemented. Um, I know I heard um, Chair Lippert mention you don't want to spend a lot of time on audio only, and I, I respect that. I know your committee is taking a lot of, obviously, a lot of testimony on that, so I won't go into detail. I will simply say our, um, our thought on, on this section um, 
8C about extending the deadline on DFR's ability to have rules until January 2024 is again for a period of transition. Um, the, op the report that DFR wrote on audio only coverage that the Health Healthcare Committee has taken some look at suggests that that there should be a transition period to paying with value-based payments and then the interim fee-for-service payments would be needed. And allowing DFR to do rulemaking around that is one um, route to accomplishing that. It would allow DFR to um, lay out the requirements for what services and or reimbursement rates would be covered in the interim period. Um, obviously, another approach is for the legislature to craft that in legislation. So it was, it's sort of a two-path option of how to accomplish the, what was asked for in that report. Um, one is statutory change. One would be allowing DFR to do it through rulemaking. Um, so one need to we support having that option of DFR putting in rule what that coverage would look like during that transition period to a value-based payment. Yeah, our, our committee is also uh, gonna be taking testimony about this because uh, we do wanna include it in the bill. And um, uh, as you're talking, uh, there's, some, there's some sense to be made of the DFR rulemaking. There's also some sense to be made of having whatever uh, rules are put forward to come back uh, to the legislature for some uh, oversight. Sure, so the, again, those are the pieces that I had um, prepared comments on or had heard questions about yesterday, but um, if, you, if there are other sections as well that you'd like to hear from the provider community on, please um, let us know and some, one of us will be, hopefully be able to answer the questions. Can, can I just- uh, can, I, Go ahead, but go ahead. I have a question uh, I, when you're done. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm more, more a comment uh, that I think you referenced a question raised by Senator Hardy in your testimony yesterday about what, what can we learn to look for, to take forward. I think it's, it's an important question and one, to be quite honest, that uh, it seems to me that we can set to the side for the moment uh, as we continue to try to extend emergency procedures while we're still in this state of emergency. Uh, but I absolutely support that we circle back and learn from what we have experienced. As I think we have learned, there are, there are definitely areas uh, that we've, we've learned uh, and that we should consider whether to uh, change our regulations or statutes going forward. But I, I'd really like to try to bookmark that for uh, future future focus of testimony. So, and to, to, to let you know that Senate Health and Welfare last session in the spring uh, put together a draft proposal on that and realized that this isn't something you can put together in the middle of a pandemic. I think we need to wait till and, we're out. out and the that, yeah, so, but then we have taken it up again as a committee and we will have a committee bill that begins the process. So um, I, I look forward to, to working on that and including not just, not just healthcare committees, but others uh, who have worked so hard during the pandemic. So we'll, we will be working on that. But Ann Donahue, Representative Donahue has her hand up Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, yes, I, I have a question on um, section 26, which is the extension of the, um, regarding telehealth, but trying to flip back to the document here. Um, specifically the, the uh, third clause, which is about um, patients informed consent. And you talked about the, um, the HIPAA compliance, and, and I understand the challenges in sort of getting up to speed and what that might require, but there are other pieces of, of informed consent. Um, and in fact, there's a question about informed consent, uh, simply telling the patient, you know, we don't have the HIPAA compliant platform right now, you know, just so you know. Um, and I'm wondering, because the, the it, it was you know, the, initially and continues to the extent that it's not practicable um, 
for informed consent. Do you know how often that has been being used where there's no discussion with the patient about some of the other provisions of the informed consent or about the fact that it's, it's not HIPAA compliant? That's a good question. I don't have any data on it. I will say, again, as an association, we are, and the associations I've been working with, making it clear to our members, I get that piece about practicable. I would think in most circumstances these days, it now is practicable. It's, you know, less of an emergency. These are getting more routine. Providers and practices can have their workflows down now and can have that conversation with a patient either at the time of the appointment or when making the appointment. Um, so we, I would expect that it wouldn't be very frequent, but I don't have any data on that for you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I just expressed my concern about that uh, continuing for a long time, uh, separate from the technology in terms of HIPAA, but just simply, um, you know, uh, providing informed consent to a patient um, in terms of the other parts of that requirement. Yeah, and I'll say we actually worked with um, by state primary care, uh, the healthcare advocate, and some others to come up with a really patient friendly consent form um, over the, I'm losing track of time now, summer and fall, um, because I think there were a lot of, there have been a lot of organizations that, you know, there's consent and there's consent and there's, you know, a, a one page short document that's written in 10 point font and filled with words that um, you may not really, you may agree to it, but not really know what you're signing. Um, and then there's really understanding what you're, what you're doing, what services there are. I'd be happy to share that with the committee. Um, I, you know, would be really interested for your, your feedback um, because I think we, we do share that in most cases, the patient should know this is what we're doing today. This is what happens if we get disconnected. This is what your charge will be. Um, you know, we've heard on telehealth in particular patients, there have been instances of patients being, you know, frustrated with, with co-pays. So we do think um, to the extent possible that should be discussed with the patient ahead of time. You know, this might be the same copay as an in-person visit. Um, so we, we should certainly share the goal of um, information being given to the patient at an appointment. And I think in, certainly in most cases of routine care now, you know, chronic care management, mental health visits, the, the, there should be the opportunity for this discussion. Um, it might be more the some of the inpatient circumstances, urgent or emergency care circumstances where um, you know it's not as easy to to implement this. Thank you. I'd, I'd appreciate um, seeing that. And you're saying that that is being used uniformly. It well, I, I, it's, it's a volunteer, you know, it's a sample out there for practices or facilities or whoever's interested to use it. Um, it's nothing, you know, required, but we did design it to meet um, both the state consent, stat, you know, statutory requirements, DIVA's requirements, Medicare has some requirements. So it is actually a tricky thing. You know, that's, I think, been one of the barriers for practices is that there are, you know, there's sort of these layers of who requires which consent and which patient is this. So we designed this to be sort of a universal, it should meet all of the requirements that we're aware of and also be understandable to the patient. Um, but it is, you know, it's voluntary for, for practices that like it, you know, maybe they've already had a form that their lawyers reviewed and they want to use their form, um, which is, you know, is fine. But um, certainly I'd, I'd be happy to share that with the committee. But uh, that would be helpful. Um, and, you know, there are other we had a, a short discussion about a bit of this uh, in committee yesterday, and it will be interesting. We'll, we'll continue our discussion around the use of federal dollars to build HIPAA com compliant technologies um, that would obviate the need for some of this. So, um, okay. Uh, I think, are there any comments that others in your group would like to make uh, relative to any of the questions that you have heard or to clarify any of the sections for us. And I, I know that the, um, I know that Laura Pelosi is here for the Vermont Healthcare Association, Julie Tesler for Vermont Care Partners, uh, Helen Laban for Bi-State Primary Care, Devin Green for, um, for the VAS, Vermont Hospital and Health um, Systems Association. So, any would any of you folks who are here on Zoom with us like to comment at this point? 
Wow. <laughs> we just saved your committee a lot of time. <laughs> yes, you did. No, and we uh, let me just say that the work that this group has done throughout the pandemic has been extremely helpful to both of our committees and and we really appreciate it. And now that we're getting we're now that we're feeling like the vaccine is around, we're asking more discreet questions and I think Representative Donahue's is a good example of that. Um, so we'll We'll continue to work together and we appreciate your time. Well, thank you. And feel free to reach out to any one of us at any time. We all know how to reach each other very easily. So we're happy to field questions to the right group of people. Thank we you. just walked down the hall. That's all. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Well, thank you for your time. Thanks for hearing from us yeah, this morning. Yeah, right. let, let me let me second second what Senator Lyons just said too. We could not have we could not have accomplished what we did without the absolute uh, immediate and in-depth cooperation and recommendations from the coalition, which we, the, the, the coalition, which has no name. Uh, oh, it does. Had, it's, a, it's the Star Wars Alliance. <laughs> well, well, whatever, whatever it is call, called, but it, it, it has been one of the most effective uh, uh, efforts uh, that I've seen in, in, in many, many a year. And so I, the way that people cross professional uh, areas to just chime in and work collaboratively with us as legislators was uh, profoundly important. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there, I mean, there are some sections uh, that were in the acts that we passed earlier that are not in here. So, and those also, I'm, uh, I'm thinking that you have, um, that you've decided that those are no longer appropriate at this time. And uh, you know, the, for, the one that comes to the top of my head is the provider tax. Well, we, we, walked through, we looked at what, um, you know, the chart from, from Jen and the draft, and it looked like those all, the, some, <clears throat> there are some sections that our group cares about, but they were, most of those were already pegged to the state of emergency or COVID diagnosis or some kind of more ongoing point in time. So we were comfortable with that approach. Okay. Jen, did you want to comment on that? All right, well, I think Jess is exactly right. Those were things like the provider tax are already tied to six months after the end of the state of emergency. And the other provisions that are not in here that were in your other X were things that were codified in statute, so they don't require an extension. So I think everything that had a, an expiration date of some sort is included in the legislation and you may decide to take some out after testimony. Um, but I, I think they were consistent in their approach. Okay. Um, and if the six months post emergency becomes an issue, we should know about that uh, to put the date certain in, but thinking that some of, as you were indicating earlier, transition time becomes uh, important. Can I, can I just suggest, Jen, that could you flag, uh, and I think it's in the chart, but could you flag those which don't have an extension beyond the kinds of extension that we've just been talking about, which would, I think there's maybe a, I'm not going to overstate this, but OPR has suggested a date certain of March to 2022. And I think Jessa, on behalf of the coalition, has said they, in further reflection, would support that date certain as well. So if that emerges as a proposal in the legislation, if should we adopt that, would you flag the other provisions which have other uh, extension points, such as six months past emergency declaration, et cetera, so that we can review those to see if any of those should be brought into conformance with a single extension point in time, which might, and whether we should consider does that add clarity or does that add confusion? <laughs> because there's, uh, there's something to be said for having a single point of extension uh, that, so that we all know what, what, what has been extended and to when. But I'm, not gonna, I, I'm making no prejudgment about that at this point, but I think we should, we, we should be aware of that and consider the, whether or not to have that single point of extension for those as well. Uh, yes, uh, I, I agree with that. That's a good comment. And so that would serve both committees. Our committee is going to continue this work later in the week. So it would be helpful to begin looking at that. 
Okay. All right. Any other uh, questions of clarification? Jen, did you want to add anything? Good. Okay. This is Devin Green from Buzz. I just wanted to quickly add that we, we at least from the hospital side, we did look at those provisions. Some of them affect hospitals and we did not think that they needed to be brought into the single point. Things like extending the Green Mountain Care Board flexibilities to six months out after the emergency and that sort of thing. And that's mainly just because they really are tied to the emergency. And we also don't have the same communication issues as um, OPR may have. You know, we have a discrete amount of hospitals. We can communicate pretty easily with them. And so we're not as concerned about those provisions um, that are not included in the current legislation. Thank you. Um, then it would be helpful to get uh, maybe a, a short written um, testimony that we can have on our webpage for, uh, if you don't mind, that'd be helpful. Okay. Yep, I'll do that. And and any of the other folks who are here within the coalition who um, can also do that, um, or the coalition as a whole, that would be um, very very helpful to both committees. Okay. All right. Well, then, um, thank you, Jessa. Thank you. We'll we'll move on to our insurance representatives who are here. I keep looking for my agenda. Oh, I've got so much open on my <laughs> iPad. It's, there it is. Uh, so yes, I know uh, Sarah Teachout um, is here. Are you here, Sarah? I am here. <laughs> okay. Um, why Thank don't you, you um, you've heard the discussion and you know what the issues are. And I think your most particular interest is telephone only, uh, and we're happy to hear your testimony. Yes, um, I was gonna talk more broadly about the provisions um, extending beyond the, the, the emergency period for three months, the way that you have drafted. I did spend quite a bit of time with the House Healthcare Committee talking about our concerns about audio only care. And I'd love the opportunity to do that specific for the Senate Health and Welfare Committee, but I'd rather not repeat the testimony um, for okay. everyone. So uh, we just, can do that. Clear, uh, we, we'll have, we may even have time later this week to do that. So I thank you. I would appreciate that. So um, just to lay the background, um, all of our state healthcare policies are an attempt to balance consumer protections, access to care, cost, and safety. Um, and during the height of the COVID lockdown, we chose to emphasize access to care over some of these other considerations, which everyone strongly supported. Um, as we progressed through the pandemic from full lockdown, which was what we were originally responding to, to this partial reopening phase, which is you know a little bit strange, and hopefully into the newer vaccination phase, and then maybe someday it'll be done. Um, some of these measures may be out of balance, and I hope that the committee will consider that this is a continuum and not a single point in time. Um, and I just had one example I wanted to talk about, um, and that's the early prescription refill policies um, that we really did at the height of the lockdown to prevent, um, to allow people access to their Medicaid when they were afraid to leave their homes, unable to see their providers, um, and really needed their medications. Um, the reason that we have uh, refill limits um, in place is to prevent excess amounts of prescription drugs in people's medicine cabinets, um, to um, prevent these medicines from being wasted if they fill a prescription and then for some reason have to switch to something else. Um, and also because they can be potentially dangerous for individuals or family members in the house. So just, I'm not saying that we um, don't support extending these throughout the full phase of the emergency, but just really do consider the balance of the consumer protections we try and put in place um, and the cost protections um, with the access to these medications in that particular instance. Um, well, so are you talking about, so the, uh, some of the prescription I don't have sections. your chart. 
<laughs> okay, well, it, the draft legislation has it, but when yes. Lauren Hibbert uh, was talking, she and Jen, you're going to have to help me with this. She suggested that page eight, section 11 was no longer needed. And I, right. Okay. This, I think Sarah's talking about a different provision. The one she's talking about is section nine. Okay. This is the one that requires health insurance plans and Medicaid to allow members to refill prescriptions for their chronic maintenance medications early so they can have a 30 day refill at home, I think. Or maybe yes. it was the. Is that yeah, pharmacist is that right? flexibility piece, I, I believe, is already now in statute or in, right. in right. regulation? That's right. right. No, it's in statute. You're right. 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 And to be honest, that one's been super helpful. We believe dealing with those types of issues when the person is in the pharmacy filling their prescription is preferential to honestly sending them home and spending a lot of time um, on the telephone figuring out what they need. So that, that truly has been a really helpful provision. Um, a couple other things I wanted to say just more broadly about extending these. Um, I believe for us, a date certain would be helpful. Um, we have a lot of technical changes to make, um, notifications to do, and so certainly a date certain would be, I think, more helpful for, for our members. Um, and then the last thing I would want to bring up is that um, largely our self-funded employers have complied with every one of these emergency regulations. Once we get into a post-emergency period, um, I think each of them will be reassessing to, the, to their own company priorities what their value is here, whether this is something that is valuable for their employees or if it's too costly for the employer and making a decision there. So I just wanted to say that it, the way that these have been implemented have been fairly smooth for providers um, because everyone has complied. I think we may be entering as we go into this gray area of phase where there is more differentiation between how these are being treated. Um, and I just wanted to make that very clear. So when we get into the post-emergency phase, that's where, where it may be more difficult um, for everyone. And then the last thing I, I, I will talk, you know, I think everyone knows um, our position on audio only care, um, just extending it to 2024 without some patient protections and some other changes um, we find troubling, um, and we would like to propose um, some, some, some changes for the transition period, I think, some consumer protections as well as some ways to get additional data for quality analysis. So I won't go into it any longer because I know others have heard from me already on that, but we do have some recommendations there. And okay. I, I, uh, so questions of clarification, and I see uh, Senator Hardy's hand is up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Sarah, thank you for that testimony. I, I do have a clarification question on the issue you brought up with self-insured employers. Um, mm -hmm. And are you specifically talking about their comp compliance with the um, prescription um, pieces, or are there other things that in this bill that are optional for the self-insured employers? Right, um, I, I'm mostly focused on the prescription drug pieces and the audio only care, the telehealth moving forward. I think okay. those are the two costly, more costly provisions that self-funded employers may not choose to continue. Okay, and I haven't heard your testimony on audio only yet, so I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll wait to get your take on that. But um, but I, I just want to clarify that your point is that moving forward, as things change, they may decide they're not going to go along with this because they're not required to because they're federally regulated. Is that correct? And they correct. May decide that it's too costly for their bottom line of insuring their employees. Is that an accurate summary of what Okay, I just wanted I to believe be so. Okay, thank you. Can I, uh, can I just follow up on that? Just because this becomes a point of understanding for uh, members uh, new to the committee and ongoing. Uh, and so Jen, I just, I'm gonna see if I can. So Sarah, just to clarify that self-funded plans 
were not in fact uh, required to follow the emergency uh, changes that we put into statute because in fact they're not required to follow our statutes in the first place. Is that fair to say? I mean, um, what you're saying is that most of them did, but, yeah. but, that, but that was a voluntary choice of compliance. Correct. And there are some nuance because some of the things that we did in state mirrored federal regulations that apply to ERISA plans. So just, just to be clear. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, but, but broadly, broadly, broadly. Uh, when we, again, when we made emergency changes to legislation, uh, it was really to modify ongoing legislation and self-funded plans are, are not regulated by the state of Vermont under our statutes uh, because of the ERISA exception. Or broadly, I don't know if that's a fair, accurate way to describe it, but I think that's what we all understand it to be. Okay, is that consistent with what your understanding is, Jen? Yes, we, the state is preempted under federal law from regulating the self-funded plan. So to Sarah's point, there are certain pieces that the when the federal government did some emergency provisions uh, yeah. around access to, to COVID um, testing and things like that, that they specifically applied to those self-funded plans, but nothing Vermont could do was going to reach those plans. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, Representative uh, Goldman has her hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just wondering if one could make any generalizations of the types of patients or populations covered by self-funded plans as opposed to other segments of the population in terms of, you know, access to care or, you know, those kinds of things, access to resources. Um, that other populations might not have. And you may not be able to, but I, it, I was just curious about that. So, so listen, I think that is an awesome question. And it's a, it's a question that uh, deserves uh, discussion during your committee time. So I, I'm, going to, <laughs> I'm going to defer that question over to both our committees because uh, I think it's a good one. Uh, and it helps us to understand uh, insurance programs generally and what we can and cannot regulate more specifically. So excellent yeah. question. Let's, 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 let's bring that back to committee. Yeah. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assign uh, Senator Hardy with that question and bring it back to committee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions for uh, Sarah? Uh, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, and we'll, we'll look forward to having you in, uh, back in committee. And I know the House uh, will also. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we also have um, Chuck Starro, who is uh, representing MVP Healthcare, uh, and he's going to talk about audio only. I think, Chuck, are you here? I am, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, committee. Uh, Chuck Starro, Leonine Public Affairs, on behalf of MVP. I was planning on speaking to uh, only the audio only issue, but um, I did speak to the House Healthcare Committee on that issue last Friday. And I think I heard you say, Madam Chair, that um, we would be coming back to Senate Health and Welfare you know, at a later date to speak on that issue. So I'm happy to speak about it now, but I don't wanna bore the uh, members of the House Committee uh, by repeating what I told them last week and I'm happy to wait until a different date for to speak to your committee uh, specifically on this issue. However you would like to go, I'm happy to go forward right now too. What I think would be helpful is rather than get full bore into your testimony, would be to give a, a quick oversight uh, of, of what it is that you're going to be, you have represented in, in house health care and what you will be representing. Just kind of the, um, the intro, if you don't mind. Certainly, um, you know, the, the essence of MVP's position on this issue of audio only or uh, a, a coverage mandate for audio only healthcare services is that there should be uh, a coverage mandate or that it's okay that there is a coverage mandate. I shouldn't say should be, but we're okay with that. Um, but that there not be a requirement as is the case currently under DFR's rules 
that reimbursement be at parity with the level of a reimbursement that would be the case if it was say in-person uh, provision of healthcare services that there are features of audio only uh, healthcare services that uh, may or, or should uh, dictate that uh, reimbursement be at a different level, um, you know, namely less. Um, it may be appropriate in some cases that it be at it, at, at parity, um, but that there's no one size one uh, you know uh, size fits all kind of solution to that, and that the issue not be spoken to in either legislation. The issue being reimbursement rates in either legislation or in rules, but that it be left to uh, the insurers and the providers to uh, work out. Okay, thank you for that. Um, that, that helps us, uh, that, that's a good refresher course for the house folks and it's a good uh, startup for us. So we'll, and we will be uh, asking you to come in with some testimony, so thank you. Good, okay. thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Very good, and I know Margaret Lagas is here also, and we we have we have some time. So, uh, Margaret, um, thank you for being here, and why don't you introduce yourself, and then give give us. Um, I think you're also talking only about audio. Is that right? Correct. So, for the record, my name is Margaret Lagas, and I represent America's Health Insurance Plans, which is a national association of health insurance providers. Um, and all of the ancillary businesses that go along with that, whether it's pharmacy benefit managers, mental health managers, et cetera. Um, and I am gonna comment about audio only because I have not spoken to the House uh, Healthcare Committee yet. So it'll be new for both of you. Um, during the pandemic, uh, all care, whether in person, audio visual or audio only was reimbursed in Vermont. And as was recently stated, even the self-funded ERISA plans uh, followed that guidance in Vermont. Moving forward, there should be a separation and recognition of the differing levels of care offered by these three options. We support, as Jessa Barnard just said as well, we support a value-based payment. Pricing decisions should be data-driven. If we have learned anything during this pandemic, it is that policy should be based on well-defined data. Pricing should be a decision between the providers and insurers. And as you have already heard, at least the House Committee did, um, the office visit payment that providers receive includes what is assumed to be work that may be required outside of the actual office visit. And it also includes uh, costs associated with actually having an office, the bricks and mortar and the employees required to just have an office. These payments also include things like reading and interpreting test results, extra phone calls, consults if necessary, setting up additional appointments with other providers. So some of these audio only appointments would already be covered under this in-person patient payment. Some patients may avoid coming in for in-person vision visits if they want to avoid some difficult conversations that may happen due to routine intake evaluations like weight, blood pressure, and possibly blood tests around diabetes. So we want to be sure that in-person is the gold standard. However, the state could incidentally discourage the growth of telehealth by making short-term policy decisions that have long-term unintended negative impacts on individuals who need affordable health care. If policymakers require employers, individuals, and taxpayers to subsidize providers for bricks and mortar infrastructure as part of virtual visits, the cost savings potential that telehealth can promise will be jeopardized. Two recent sources of information show that the average telemedicine visit costs less compared to an in-person visit. Teladoc Health Data shows that average telemedicine visits cost $45 compared to 141 for in-person and according to Health Affairs, the average telehealth visit costs $79 compared to 146 in office. And so their data is a little bit different, but both show that there is a fairly striking difference uh, in the cost to provide these services. A mandate requiring that healthcare purchasers pay the same for telehealth visit as the in-person visit will likely impact affordability. For telehealth to realize its potential, 
government should not be burdening it with the same cost structure as bricks and mortar healthcare settings. Additionally, telehealth visits do not always require the same level of intensity, the same amount of time, or the same equipment as in-person visits and are not a replacement for in-person visits. Creating a one-size-fits-all policy measure for care that should and must be patient-centered and individually based is not only the wrong direction, but could increase costs American healthcare consumers pay. Whenever we require payment for new services or parity for differing care, we raise the overall cost of care. As Vermont moves toward capitated payments through the ACO, this kind of thinking actually moves us in the wrong direction. And as you already heard, uh, ERISA plans happen to have complied with all of the measures that DFR instituted for the pandemic, but they are unlikely to do so going forward because they're not required to follow. Um, and I do have uh, sources and I will submit um, this testimony in writing to the committee so that you can see the sources for both Teladoc um, and telehealth. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, that was my question, if you would please submit it. Um, yes. And I do have a question. Um, uh, as we're looking at Teladoc and telehealth, is the, is the pricing that you're talking about pricing that is based on kind of the value-based uh, payment determination? So based on the patient needs and patient then patient care, or is it based on... Um, negotiated contracts between uh, health providers and health insurers? So this particular uh, cost differentiation was based only on the actual cost to the provider to provide that care. It didn't differentiate between the quality of care. You know, it didn't say because you were audio only, because this was considering telehealth in the broader sense, both audiovisual and audio only. Um, as you can imagine, audio only, you can't see the pallor of your patient. You, you know, you can't, there are a lot of things that you can't see about your patient, your patient's demeanor, or how they're walking, um, you know, whether you feel like there's been a decline in their mobility or their mental health status. A lot of that, those are visual clues that you just don't get in, uh, in audio only visit. But these numbers are strictly the cost to the provider to provide the services to the patient. Okay, thank you. And, and you'll send us along the yes. information that you have to yep. Questions of clarification uh, from uh, Margaret? I, yeah, I'd like to just ask, Margaret, thank you. Uh, we had not had a chance to hear from you and uh, appreciate your coming forward. Can you, can you just clarify for members though, which are the, uh, which are the insurance companies that uh, offer uh, services or offer insurance in Vermont that you represent? Currently, uh, Cigna and MVP are the two larger ones, and then many companies that happen to have a few individuals or are in the large group plans are also members of AHIP. Blue Cross Blue Shield is not a member currently. Right. Okay. I think it's just, in, just useful for people to understand the scope of uh, representation. Yes. Because um, the, 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 uh, that's a good, that's a really the, the trade. The trade name doesn't really capture that for us. Right. <laughs> it doesn't. If, I mean, when you, when you send along your info, maybe add, add a little bit about that, that'd be helpful. Sure, I will do that. Um, Representative Goldman and then Representative Black. Just a point of clarification for me, when we're talking about parity, are we talking about parity with in-person visits or parity with just um, audiovisual visits? So can there be a distinction between in face-to-face -face and then not face-to-face? -face? There, there should be. Um, a value-based payment set up uh, between providers and insurers or through a, a structure that DFR sets up um, that recognizes the difference in the value of care that is delivered. It's not saying whether audio-visual would be equal to inpatient or equal to audio only. It would be that you would look at the data and make those decisions based on, on the actual data that you can show on uh, healthcare outcomes from the varying different types of visits. Can I, can, can I just ahead, also jump in and say that I think the use of our, the use of the term value-based payments may be confusing in this context because that's a term that we use, we're using broadly in terms of payment reform. And I think what you're talking, I believe if I'm correct, what you're talking about is the value of the, 
the, the service to the patient. Correct. Yeah. Which, so yeah. just th there's a, there's a cross section of terminology, yeah. which is the same word and language, but different, different kinds different of entirely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, oh, you're not, way. you're not recommending at first, it sounds like you're recommending that this be done through a value-based payment reform. That's not what you're talking about. No, but a recognition of the differing values that these right. different patient visits give to a patient. Yeah, so that's why I just feel like, <laughs> thank you. Clinical yeah. condition. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, now, that's a good point uh, to be made. It would be neat if all of our payments were value-based. That a is a whole nother discussion. That's a much bigger My discussion. perspective. Anyway, um, Representative Black. Thank you. Simple question. Is United Healthcare part of your organization as well or no? Yes. They are? Okay. Okay. Uh, and United Healthcare does a lot of the uh, supplemental plans. Is that right? For Medicare? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions for our witnesses? Wow. So, uh, so I'd just like to say thank you to both committees and to everyone who has testified today. Representative Lippert and I are back to the drawing board, I guess. But. Yeah, it, did, it does seem like Representative, or Senator Lyons, it does seem that the testimony that we've heard today uh, at least in my mind, leads us in the direction of a fixed point in time. Uh, uh, has been, see, there seems to be now, it'd be fair to say, some movement in that direction toward a consensus rather than a point past a declaration of emergency. And, uh, and I think that, that, that this, this is helpful, that this, that seems to be what most of our witnesses have been moving toward uh, as a result of the testimony we heard this morning. Is that? Yeah, I agree. And then uh, the, this, the other areas that are not included in the bill that we, we have felt were sort of had a transition time that uh, we've asked folks to go back and review those. So we'll make a determination as to whether they should also have a point in time, but that'll be something we can also look at. And then finally, I think the one area of um, concern that we may have to work a little more on, maybe have more than a, the paragraph that's there, uh, is on audio only. Yeah. And we'll and, and we will we will be crafting a separate proposal based on our testimony that will either when you I think we've agreed. Let me. Is it fair to say, Senator Lyons, that we've you and I have talked about using your uh, committee, your committee is likely to move forward a bill that we will then receive in the House. And again, we're needing to do this within the time frame to move it uh, before the, so that we yeah. can get past all the deadlines before March 31st. Yes, I think we'd like to do that as quickly as possible. Right. And so uh, we'll, our committee will get up to speeds on the audio only and then maybe there's a way of integrating language so that we're all on the same page as we move the bill forward. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and I think the other area that there seems to be common agreement on is that there are certain sections that were articulated by OPR that can be deleted from extension, right? If we, so. uh, if we hear differently from you or um, uh, an outcry from constituents, we'll yeah. take that into consideration, I guess. Right. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, and just uh, just like to let the House Committee know that the Senate Committee has a reputation. We have our own little reputation for finishing early, and now we have. So we're on we're wow. on target. Well, we're uh, going to take, we're going to take a break as the House Healthcare Committee because we have a reputation for making sure that our health and welfare of our members is thought about, <laughs> as I'm sure you do as we well. We always work as on I'm that. I'm sure you're doing as well, but so we are going. So I, so we, we're going to leave this Zoom yeah. and you, you guys can stick, stick around. Uh, our committee is going to take a break. Um, and let me, let me just look at, uh, find my agenda again. Um, we're due back at 1045, so we'll take a break until then. So um, we can leave this Zoom and we'll come back to 
the Zoom that Nellie uh, has sent out to us. Thank Great. you. Th thanks, thanks, Representative Lippert. Thanks, yes, thank you, Senator Lyons. I think this was a good choice to do collaboratively yeah. once uh, again. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. So committee members uh, and for members or witnesses who may be in the wings or the waiting room, uh, I think we do need to take a, a break. And uh, I'm going to suggest that we also take a break till 1045. That will give us an hour. I think that should be sufficient, hopefully to hear from the witnesses we have lined up. Uh, and then we will also, our goal will be to finish up at 1145. So let's, let's come back, take a break, Again, reminder, put yourself on mute and off video, and Colleen will put up a, a notice saying that we're on a break, but we're coming back. Uh, it'd be great, Colleen, if there's some way to learn, if there's a way for us to signal when we're coming back uh, with a time on that, if that you could check with IT for the future. But uh, let's go on a break. We'll see you back at 1045. We'll start promptly then. Thank you. <laughs>